All right. So my name's Trent Morrow. I'm the owner of LMB Counseling. We are a private practice here in South Charlotte. We've been around for over 10 years. Uh, we predominantly see uh, clients that have anxiety, depression, uh, adjustment issues, um, and kind of see the gambit of 10 year olds and, and up and tweens, teenagers and, and adults. Um, I also have two children. Uh, the L and B stand for my children's initials, Logan and Braden. Logan is a ninth grader at Audrey Kell uh, High School. And then my son, Braden is a seventh grader at Community House. So certainly can relate to some of the challenges that we have uh, been dealing with maybe since March 13th. Um, and so, like I said, if you have questions, please stop. It's easier to get to it in real time. Um, and hopefully if you will find this very informative. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the things that we're uh, gonna talk about today or this evening. Um, we're gonna talk about the what, the why, and the how. So kind of what in the world has been going on? Why is it happening? We're gonna talk about that from a more of a, a neuroscience perspective. Um, and then more importantly, you're probably wondering how you can manage it all. So we're gonna go in more detail with this stuff, but uh, what is happening? I want you to understand it from three perspectives. One is a grief perspective, a disruption of routine, and then something at LMB counseling we call the haunted house syndrome. So, um, you know, most of us, um, if, if you're my age, I'm 46, um, have experienced some sort of grief in our life, but um, maybe some of our kids, depending on how young they are, ha have not. And so um, during this period that it kind of occurred on March 13th, when everything just kind of shut down, um, we've all experienced some sort of grief, uh, but some of us, especially our little ones, uh, probably did not have something to anchor to as far as understanding what grief is, how to deal with it. Um, and it's certainly while everyone else was kind of going through all this together, it's not like uh, we lose a family pet or maybe a loved one. Um, and, the, and the family kind of rallies together. The world was going through all this at once. And so a lot of it felt very chaotic. And so when you experience grief, for those of you who, who don't know, um, you, you go through these, they're not stages, you know, you don't go from one to the next to the next. Um, just consider them like moments in time. So you're gonna experience denial, you're gonna experience anger, sadness, uh, bargaining and acceptance. And each event is its own kind of marker. So if you, for instance, have you lost a family pet and then you lost another family pet, each one of those is its own grief um, incident or a grief situation. And so you're going to feel different things about that from different time. And so what's happened during COVID is you know, we've lost a lot of things. Um, some people have lost loved ones, uh, income, access. Uh, lost uh, events, being able to play sports and hobbies and, and recreational things, get together, sleepovers. Um, you kind of name it and go down the list. I bet you could name a lot of things that you've lost during this time um, that all relates to, co uh, relates to COVID and grief. And so to understand that, um, you know, your children may not have any concept or didn't have any concept at the time for what that was, and therefore had a really hard time dealing with it. And, and we did as, as well as adults, given all the multitude of things that were going on in our life and then still are going on in our life. So um, there's a lot of things that tie into grief. And so when you deal with, you, you kind of think like if you lost a pet, then another pet, then maybe a loved one in a short amount of time, that turns into more complex grief. And so we'll talk about it in a little bit, kind of ways to deconstruct that and, and work on that. But just understand from a grief perspective, this is a lot of what we're feeling, um, we being us and, and your children. Um, another thing that uh, happened and, and still is happening um, to us on, on a daily basis is this disruption of routine. Our brain is designed to know um, how long something's gonna last and we need that anchor or these are the things that we do on a daily basis. I was just talking to uh, one of my college students today about, you know, when he was coming home, he couldn't tell if he was home for summer break or winter break or fall break, um, because every day felt the same, even though um, there were some things that had changed. And so our brain needs that routine. We need to that routine because it allows us to automate. Um, and automation is just taking information and doing it over and over again so you no longer have to think about it. And so what happened during COVID and is still happening is that we've lost some of that rhythm to our life, whether we go to church or we have a sports or a hobby uh, throughout the week or on the weekend. There's a lot of rhythm to what we were doing 
And back in March, it just abruptly stopped. And of, of course, nothing has started back the way it was. Even school now of, you know, you being in the way that you're in, there's a rhythm to that. But there was a lot of disruption around that. And even with kids that are doing online learning, like my kids are all on online learning, um, you know, they get into somewhat of rhythm and then there may be something new that we add in and then they have to kind of repivot and we have to repivot as caregivers to uh, kind of meet their needs. And so all these things were happening at once and all these routines got disrupted all at once. And to some extent, some people have kind of picked themselves back up and get into routine. And then in other ways, things continue to happen that do not allow us to get into that rhythm and get into that routine. And so it kind of discombobulates our brain when we don't have things that we know what to expect and when we know to expect them. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a minute, but just understand that this disruption in routine um, and the way the world is working, especially for our kiddos, um, has caused a lot of internal distress. Another thing that um, I want you to think about, we just call it the haunted house syndrome. And, and, and this has been occurring uh, since the 13th of March, um, is this idea that um, when you go into a haunted house, you know that there's gonna be um, some stress. You're choosing to go in there, you're choosing to go in there and, and get scared. Um, even if you know it's going to happen, even if you know that you're not going to get hurt, you're still more likely to react to the thing that jumps out and scares you or chases you or whatever. And so if you want to think of like your emotional temperature of one to 10, um, 10 is being under a lot of distress and it's being discombobulated. Generally, when, you're, um, when your emotional temperature rises, your IQ drops um, up to about 15 points. So as those two things, as one goes up, one goes down. And so us being in this constant state of hypervigilance, um, especially now since the numbers have gone back up um, and, and things, you hear things being bantered about, uh, whether it's in the national media or the local media or whatever the case may be, um, it causes us to be in this constant state of trying to figure out what's next, trying to make sure that we're uh, safe and secure. This just shows again, like with uh, the toilet paper and the paper towels, being sold out, you know, we went through that and then everything kind of chilled out and then the numbers pick back up and then you start seeing behavior that um, mirrors what's going on with the COVID numbers. And so when people are in this hyper state, they're in this um, kind of like scarcity of resources, doing what they need to do to keep themselves and their family safe. And so it messes with the mind and never really makes us feel like we truly got out of the haunted house. Um, and even though we may have had a reprieve, and this could be more on a, a family level, individual level, or even kind of a society level, we always have felt like there's always a constant monitor that we're in the haunted house, even if we thought we weren't for a minute. Um, and so this constant state of hypervigilance, which we'll show here in a little bit, it has some um, pretty profound impacts on the brain and, and just the systems in general. Any questions about uh, what's going on right now? Um, with uh, how to consider through the fear and the routines and then the haunted house syndrome? Okay. So that was the what, uh, just to give you some perspective. Now I wanna to talk to you about the why. So why you, why your, your family, why your, your kiddos may be experiencing some of this stuff. Um, the brain is constantly wiring itself to the environment. It's doing that like we talked about before, so we can just pass stuff off. It's uh, You think of your multiplication tables. You think of how to hold your pencil so you can write. You think of learning to read. And then over time, as you get better and better at that, you automate. So you're able to kind of push that off, be more reflexive. You no longer have to think what is three times three. And you can do higher math, whether that's division or whatever comes after that. So more than 50% of your day is automated. Um, you're not having to think about doing those things. It gives you space and time to now do harder things, cognitive tasks. Um, the simplest illustration of that is if you drive down the street and you have a pothole um, for too long, you just magically drive around the pothole because it, in the beginning you thought about it and over time you just learned to go around the pothole and then it became automated and now you're able to do something else. Um, and so this is a wonderful thing when we have the right information and we have the right data to help us wire. But when things are like they are now, it's called the, the haunted house syndrome, that starts going in and messing with our wiring. And so from an automation standpoint, it's not so clear what we can automate to, what we can count on or anchor to. 
Um, and so we're spending more energy and time thinking about what's happening, what's coming next, um, putting us in that hypervigilance like we were talking about. The other thing that is happening um, that your brain is constantly doing and you're not conscious of it most of the time um, is this idea of duration, pathway, and outcome. Uh, it's the reason if you get on a flight, the, uh, the captain tells you how long the flight is gonna take. Um, it's the reason why you pull up your Google Maps, um, you know how long that drive is gonna take. It's the reason why you buffer the amount of time you buffer um, to get to school on time or to do whatever on time. Your brain's constantly looking for that duration. How long is this task going to take? The pathway is what is it that I need to do to accomplish the thing that I'm about to do? And the outcome is just what you've decided uh, success looks like. Well, so what COVID did and it's continuing to do is it has gone in and messed with duration and outcome. And so when you do that fundamentally to a brain, when you take something away that you need to anchor to, to be able to decide how long something's going to take. It's the same reason in elementary school, like y'all, is they've got stuff everywhere all over the walls. It tells you how long these classes are going to be, uh, what happens next, when's recess, when's uh, lunch, um, when's break, when's bathroom. It's so kids can anchor to, all right, well, this is the thing I'm going to do, and this is how long I need to do it before I need to move on to the next thing. And outcome is pretty well defined. Teachers do a really good job of saying, all right, this is what the objectives will look like for today or in this particular class. That's all the, um, a derivative of duration, pathway, and outcome. And COVID went in and took all that away. It took away, um, kind of going back to March to now, we don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, we don't know definitively how long this is going to last. And we don't know from outcome perspective what outcome looks like. Is it that everyone's back in school five days a week? Is it that we're back in school five days a week with no mask? Um, is it that we can get together in bigger groups? If we can have play dates. There's all these different things that you could do to measure outcome, and everyone's going to have different perspectives on what that outcome is. And so, it when that's taken away, our brain has a really hard time um, from a distress, you can call it worry, anxiety um, perspective. And so, it becomes very challenging and it's distracting. It can be distracting. You may be seeing it in the classrooms, you may be seeing it at online school at home school, um, you may be sitting in your own personal life when you can't make sense of these things and you don't have something to know how long something's going to take. Um, it's harder to put your energy and effort into it from a pathway perspective. And we're designed to do hard things. It gives us adrenaline and dopamine when we believe in what we're doing. But if we don't know how long something's going to take, it's harder for us to put that effort in. So you think about that from, you know, your kiddos perspective as caregivers, um, when, when they don't know those kind of things or, or how long those things are going to last, it causes a lot of distress. And you may be seeing that distress in different ways. You may be seeing irritability and apathy, um, especially with some of your older kids. Um, so it, it's showing up and bubbling up in different ways. It may be sho uh, showing up in anxiety or, or even depression symptoms, things like that, which we can talk a little bit more about. So some other stuff kind of talking about that. Uh, that adrenaline um, that we talked about in that haunted house syndrome, um, you've got the, the gazelle being chased by the lion down here. And um, one of the things that we are similar to um, when it comes to arousal states is when we are under attack, we generally have three response systems. We have, I'm gonna freeze, I'm going to flee, or I'm gonna fight. And so all those are evolutionary byproducts that allows the species to continue on. And so with this antelope, if it continues to outrun the lion, it will pass on its DNA. And so the species will continue to evolve and um, the lion will continue to eat. That's how they uh, continue to evolve because they become better hunters. So what happens in the animal kingdom is this event happens. The lion chases the, the antelope. The antelope gets away. In a very short order, all of that uh, arousal systems that dumps over 23 different hormones and neurochemicals throughout the body and the brain so it can pump uh, blood and muscle groups and all these other things to get away from the lion, it comes back down. So that emotional temperature comes back down really quick. That way, the next time the lion chases it, it's ready and it can sprint away. It may do this a couple of times a day. So where we differ, because our response system is the same, but where we differ is um, our system does not go back down very quickly. We, because we have such a, an evolved brain and, and the prefrontal cortex 
is doing like algorithms to figure out where's the next attack, what's going to happen next, how can I predict it, how can I make sure that this won't happen again. Um, and so it starts sometimes if it has bad data, it starts making predictions on on improper data, and that's that hyper vigilance that we've been in. Um, sometimes things have been fine, foundation has been fine, but our feelings and our arousal system, our neurochemical system is saying we're not, we need to be on alert, we need to be on alert. And so on the short term, very short term, like a day, if you do that, you experience brain drain. Um, it's, it's things you may be seeing in your kids, uh, but certainly probably seeing in yourself. And what happens over the course of a day, your cognitive ability to problem solve, to deal with life, to deal with emotions, to deal with heightened states, it goes down. Um, and so you're more prone to be irritable and respond in that way. Um, and if you do that, if you've been responding that way, if you've been feeling that way um, since, let's say, March, so that's a long time to be operating that way. And your system is almost like this antelope on a daily basis. It wakes up and is expecting the lion. And so that's a bad outcome when it comes to our health. Um, it, it impacts things that we'll talk about here in a little bit, like sleep and, and um, our mood uh, and our, our weight. Um, it, it, it impacts all these things with, with great impact. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit in a little, in, in a little bit about how to bring that back down, but just understand that if you've been operating in this state, um, that you are experiencing this. This is things that you are going through and we need breaks. Our brain needs break, just like this antelope needs a break um, so it can recharge and get ready for the next attack. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So some other things that have happened um, during COVID is we, we think of things that are in our practice as buckets because kids just have a hard, an easier time understanding that. So um, there's some really powerful, cool neurochemicals that, um, that were on board and happening pretty routinely for most of us um, prior, to, prior to COVID. Um, and dopamine is something that you get. It's a reward center. It's something that you get when um, you're doing a challenge and you believe in that challenge. Um, it comes along with adrenaline. It's a nice buffer for a neurochemical to help you sustain that effort. Um, now, dopamine can be misaligned. It doesn't have a moral compass. So it, you also can get it from doing uh, substances or um, playing video games, social media stuff we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but fundamentally, it, it's a really good neurochemical and it and pushes us into action and allows us to stay in action. It's what you get when you're doing something uh, hard, not something after you finish the project. So it actually, you get more dopamine as you're doing the, uh, the challenge than when you finish the challenge. Oxytocin is what you get. It's one of the most powerful neurochemicals there is. It's what you get when you are um, in social contexts or contact with people that you want to be around. It's when someone says they like your shirt or tell you good job, um, I like your smile, anything like that, it gives you, um, it gives you an incredible buffer from stress. And then you've got endorphins and endorphins are obviously what you get when you are exercising and reducing pain. Let me catch up, there was a question. Um, Oh, okay, not able to get questions fast enough, so I'm sorry. Uh, how long can you operate in that state? Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, there's not a definitive answer. All I can tell you is that you can, if you continue to, from a brain standpoint of producing adrenaline over and over and over, um, you're going to have some pretty serious side effects from a health perspective. To, to what extent, there's a lot of variables. It just, uh, some of it is your predisposition, some of it is your environment. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that um, can come along uh, to influence some of it's sleep too, but it can influence how you're doing with these, uh, these different moments. Um, so I'll, I'm sorry, I'll ask, uh, I'll just stop and, and wait a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds before the next uh, slides. Um, we have a whole presentation about um, screens and, and what they're doing to our brains from a research uh, perspective, especially with video games and social media. Um, I think the generally what I've read and studied and learned is the good news is doing the online learning um, isn't diminishing our neurochemicals like dopamine. 
Um, it's more from video games and social media. Um, and so just understand that um, this is true for yourself and, and true for your kids too. If you go, um, if you're doing online school, and this is where we're seeing the biggest problem, um, and you, there's a break in class, and then you go and pick up your phone or, or get on video games and things like that, you're not turning off your adrenaline. You're just trading one thing for another. And in most instances, it's something that's even more pleasing and rewarding. Um, and so when you do that, you, you kind of think of like a, like a cup. You know, you only have uh, so much dopamine to go around in a day. And, um, and it's different for everybody. But the, the point is, is that if you're using it for other things that aren't that um, necessary, then you are you have less to do the things that you need to do. So think of like homework. Um, you get towards the end of the day, and if you've been doing online school, but migrating back and forth between um, social media or your phone or playing games, and that is that when it's time to do homework, you're just gonna have less dopamine available to do the hard task of doing homework. And so I, I know in the practice sometimes we're seeing some of those problems occur in the afternoon. Um, we're certainly seeing problems with kids having access to other media while they're doing uh, the schoolwork. Um, and so certainly our screen time is up um, during, during the pandemic. Um, and there'll be some interesting research that comes out of all this um, when it is finally over to see what impact it may have had on, on us uh, as fully formed brains and even our, our young people um, whether that's a, a child or a tween or a teen and what, what all is going on there. Um, and we'd be happy to come back and talk to your to y'all's uh, schools about um, the screen time presentation that goes in a lot more detail. We just don't have time to, to cover it all here. Um, there's a question about pop-up screens can be an issue, correct? It, it can. I mean, it, it from, a, from an attention perspective, our attention spans about six seconds, or at least it was before uh, the pandemic. Um, it's actually lower than a goldfish. Um, and so uh, a pop-up screen, the way I relate it to uh, certainly the kids is like a car that stops and it may only stop for half a second, but as the other car kept going and the other car is what the teacher is teaching. Um, and so it's really hard to catch up to the car that just left. Um, and if you do that every time a pop-up or notification or, or anything for that matter, um, it just becomes really hard to retain that information. Um, and, and so the pop-up screens is one way that uh, the social media companies and video games company do get your attention. So the public service announcement, just know that this stuff is not good for your, your kid's brain, especially when they're doing schoolwork. Um, and that in, in, in certain quantities, it can be okay. Um, and I know it's the way that we're supposed to communicate and things like that, just understand that there's some, there's some byproducts that occur when we're on the devices and, and doing what we're doing. So now we're gonna talk about the house. We talked about the what's going on. We talked about um, the why, just from a neuroscience perspective, and then how. Um, and so we're gonna talk about these things on a couple of slides that come. So we're gonna talk about sleep, um, eat right, exercise, drink enough water, keep your uh, chemical and hormone buckets filled up and create schedules and follow them. So you as an adult, you need seven to eight hours um, a night of sleep. Uh, that's most people. There are tales, there are people that need, you know, 10 or more and there's people that can get about six or less. Those are very few um, people on earth that, that can do that. Uh, you know, for, for kids in elementary school, they're gonna need um, eight to 10. Um, or not, excuse me, nine to 11. And then your tweens and teenagers are gonna need eight to 10. And so the way we try to get people to understand that, especially our kids is uh, you have three buckets. One is your, let's say your school or work bucket. Um, then you have your free time bucket and then you have your sleep bucket. And so you wanna have evenly distributed hours. There's 56 hours in each one of those buckets. And those 56 times three add up to the number of hours there are in a week. And so, um, especially with our tweens and our, and our teenagers, we'll have this discussion to see um, where they line up because usually they are pulling from their sleep bucket and putting it into their free time bucket. Um, and we also use it as a way to say like, you have a lot more free time than you think you have. 
Um, and there's plenty of time still left over to actually do schoolwork. Um, and so that way they don't feel like they're, or think they're missing out on stuff. So we try to play around with that thinking and feeling idea. But you want them to have, and if you don't get anything really else out of this talk, it is vitally important that your kids and yourself get the right amount of sleep. Um, there's so much stuff that's tied to sleep, like we talked about. I mean, there's, um, it bolsters your flat fat cells. If you don't get enough sleep, it compromises your immune system. It makes you more dysregulated when it comes to your emotional state. Um, and it becomes really hard to continue to do hard cognitive tasks. Um, it only takes about 24 minutes less sleep than you're supposed to get to start uh, experiencing that cognitive decline. Um, and in some recent studies, what they found is that people have to have chronic sleep issues. Um, they're at a higher rate to have dementia and Alzheimer's. What they found was, and the reason for that they believe is that um, the brain, the only way the brain can get rid of its trash and the brain on average expends about 20 to 30% of the calories you burn in a day, even though it only weighs about 6% of the total body mass. Um, the only way that trash can be removed is through sleep. Um, these little ventricles open up and allows the trash to be um, dispensed of. And so if you think that you got seven hours of sleep or six hours of sleep and you needed to get eight, well, now you have some trash left over from the day before, along with whatever you're going to accumulate uh, that day. And so um, from a working memory perspective, uh, not getting enough sleep, especially for your kids, um, the things that they learned the day before don't get stored as well. And so they become harder to extract when they need that information the next day to do the things that it is built on from the day before. Um, so, and that can cause frustration and, and just things to slow down. So it's really, really important that you get enough sleep. It's like the first thing that we um, assess when you come in, we assess what is your sleep. And then we're also asking you about your screen time. Um, and what you're doing on your screen time, because those things can mitigate a lot of healthy behaviors. Um, and so it's just really important that you and your kids have enough sleep. Um, obviously, you want to eat the right type of diet that's balanced for you. Um, drink plenty of water, um, exercise. I, I think, you know, especially in the beginning and maybe even now, now that it's getting colder and stuff like that is uh, uh, we're sitting for a lot longer than we used to, especially ever in the history of, of, of us as a species. I mean, we're, we're meant to be up and moving. Um, and I know like my kids are in front of the, the screen most of the day for most of the school day. Um, and so getting up and moving around and, and having your heart rate get up is, is vitally important, you know, especially your know, elementary school kids, because they were doing that on a daily basis um, when they were going to school and still are, hopefully. Um, but it's just really important to be in movement. Um, sorry, there's one more question. Let me go. Do our kids ideally need to be connecting with other kids or are connections with family me members sufficient for oxytocin? It's actually both. And so um, kind of going back to that last thing we talked about, which kind of piggybacks on this oxytocin thing here. Um, as much as you can, and, 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 and I fully am aware of everyone um, has a different kind of COVID consciousness and what's right for them. And they, you have to respect that. Um, but we do better when we are connecting in person. Um, the brain lights up in very pretty yellows and oranges um, and reds. Uh, when we have that connection, it's, it's how kids learn. Um, it's how they, they deal with problem solving. It's how they learn conflict resolutions, how they learn social boundaries. Um, and, and it's something that's being missed. We're seeing more of it in the, in the tweens and teenagers um, because of uh, social media and technology and stuff. So it was a problem prior to COVID. Um, but oxytocin, you, you can get it from family um, and, and that's vital. I mean, that's our foundation for everything. It's how we make sense of the world and where we get our values and and learn what's right and wrong as far as uh, boundaries and stuff. Um, but it's also, it's good to get it from other kids if you can. Um, if you can't do it in person, um, if you're gonna do FaceTime or, or Zoom or whatever we're doing, um, it's important that, I'm gonna lean in just so you, I can demonstrate it. If you, if you have to do something like Zoom or screen time, you wanna lean in, because you don't get too close, but you wanna get closer. There's these um, neurons in, in our brain called mirror neurons. And so that when we get close, they engage. And so now they're more attuned, which gives us a better opportunity to get oxytocin. 
Um, you can get it over, you know, I know kids are doing stuff like video games over the mic and, and, and things like that. Um, but if you can do something like FaceTime, those kind of, those codes, these kind of modalities, they work better. Um, and when you're, you're kind of closer and more engaged. Um, so if you have to do that, touch is the greatest thing you can do. So make sure you're hugging your kids, you're loving your kids, um, as, as much as you can. They need touch. We need touch. Um, it's just a, that oxytocin is like I said, one of the strongest neurochemicals. And in, when you think of cortisol and things like that, um, there's a lot of cortisol going on ar around right now, just through all the stress that we're feeling, but oxytocin has the ability to kind of be the bully against cortisol. Um, and so that's why it's so vital that we are a social species. Uh, we are meant to be around people, even if it's a small group of people as a, a tribe, if you think back kind of in evolutionary terms. Um, and so we need those things. We need that neurochemical. We can't get it any other way other than through social connection and however you want to do that. Um, all right, any questions around any of this stuff that we talked about from the basics? Okay. So something that elementary schools are awesome at, um, and it happens in middle schools and, and high schools too, but I mean, there's a reason why stuff is plastered all over the place and, and kids know when things are happening. It's one, it's like we talked about, so you can automate, they can automate um, and know what's next. And I think it's helped during this time of, of COVID to do this at home too, um, to kind of, so they'll know what the schedule is, maybe even know what uh, you're going to have that night if you can think that far ahead for dinner, um, but, and, and to know what's coming for the weekend. Um, so they just, it allows them to go back to that anchor, allows them to automate the stuff and not wonder about what's next, when's this, when's that. Um, it just gives them uh, a sense of quietness that they, it's one less thing they have to think about. Um, and so schedules are great. Uh, kids need structure and they need schedules. Um, and so it allows them, like I said, it allows them to kind of get into a rhythm. Um, and even if that rhythm or that kind of going away from that duration pathway and outcome, even if that duration is, hey, this is just what today looks like, or if they can handle a week, this is what this week looks like. Um, you have to do, you have to be flexible around that with what your kid can handle. And if, if they get too anxious about the week, then you roll that duration back to a place where they have some control over it and they can deal with, all right, well, I can handle today or I can handle the half day or I can handle the hour. You just roll it back to a place where they feel like they have some level of control. Schedules are a nice way to do that. So the, um, the thing that I was talking about before um, and the little, uh, cartoon down here says that it, does it have a happy ending in 2020 um and, and you know i think we know the answer to that now um but uh know this for yourself and know this for your for your children like i was saying before um you know a nice way to to think of it is like a one to ten um and and related to their health so that emotional temperature think about their actual temperature you know if you take their temperature and they're at a 98 think of that like a one two maybe a three um so you're not going to do anything. You're not even going to think about it. It's, it's not a problem. You take their temperature again, and, and let's say they're at 100. Um, it's going to catch your attention. You're going to do probably do something about it. If not, just maybe take it again in an hour. You might administer Tylenol or ibuprofen or something, but it, it's on your radar. Well, that's like a five. You know, That's a four, five, or six on their emotional meter. If you take their temperature and they're 104, you're going to be thrown into action. It's moving you into movement which is a good thing because it needs to be addressed. Well, that's a kid that's like an eight, nine or 10 or an adult for that matter. And so um, where they are on that uh, temperature gauge is gonna determine your intervention and what you need to do. Now, no one is built with this idea in mind of what is my number. So it's something that you can do as a family and just kind of say, hey, this is what we're gonna use. We're gonna use this number one to 10. And we know when it goes up, it, it actually makes our IQ, it makes us dumber. Um, and so uh, you can start teaching them like, all right, what, what, what was your number today? Or what is your number right now? If someone looks like they're in, they're in distress, it could be a significant other, it could just be another adult or child, whatever. And that way you can start getting some, some data to know where they're at, to know, you know how bad is it? It, it, may, it may not be bad at all. It may not be distressing them. Um, they, uh, maybe thinking about something altogether different. And so you may be intervening when you don't need to. And so it just gives you some information to help you know how to act as a caregiver. Um, 
we as as adults don't don't do real with this. Um, and so one of the things that we've encouraged people to do, because um, from a neuroplasticity standpoint, you know, your your kids' brains are just they're so new and they're so it's kind of like Play-Doh. There's so much we can do with it, and there's so many neural pathways that can be developed. Our brains are fully formed. It takes a lot of energy and focus to go in and build new neural pathways. And so if we didn't grow up kind of reflecting on where our number may be, then we don't have a way to automate to that um, or anchor to that. And so we have to develop that process. And so putting alarms in your phone just periodically throughout the day, whether it's four or five times, allows you to kind of orient to, well, what is my number? And now you're, you're in your prefrontal cortex, your computer, and it may allow you to intervene and bring that temperature down if you need to. Um, also understand if your temperature is up, uh, let's say it's a four or five, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we need to sometimes be in distress to actually put ourselves into action. And so if you take the temperature and, and notice that you're six, it just may signal that, hey, we're about to do something hard or we're doing something hard. And that's not a bad thing. That's something you wanna continue to do. That's how you get that dopamine. If you're at eight, nine, or 10, you may want to kind of pull it back a little bit until you can get it under control. Any questions about that? Okay. So um, this is the last page. It's going to take a little bit to get through, but these are the things to help you um, deal with some of the stuff that we talked about if it's occurring. So we do, um, we do a talk every Thursday at 11 o'clock on Facebook Live. Um, and the first two talks, excuse me, the first talk we ever did was on this first bullet point called the decision tree. It is, it goes into a lot more detail, but fundamentally it's just a system you can use to decide what you feel or what your kid feels. And based upon what they feel, you then, it sends you to a place where now you have an option to act to bring that temperature down. Um, the sadness, anger, and excitement is on one side and then worry and anxiety is on another. The reason for that is uh, we conceptualize worry as fear with facts and anxiety is fear without facts. And if you're having anxiety, you don't want us to develop a system of um, ignoring it uh, or like fleeing it because you may be ignoring something with well, its anxiety, you're ignoring something that's not real. So I'll give you an example. We had uh, a client that I treated uh, a while ago that um, had a fascination with weather and that turned into a uh, fascination with lightning. And that turned into, well, if it's uh, cloudy outside, there must be lightning. So if it's cloudy, I'm never going outside. So he developed an anxiety around clouds. Um, and so it, it's not a rational fear, but it started from kind of a rational place. Um, but his mind just took it there. So you can't always avoid that anxiety by not going outside, obviously. So sometimes the, the best way is to, to fight it and to attack it. And so uh, that first one, that first one in the series talks about um, the decision tree and how to conceptually think about that. Um, there's a lot of others. There's like 26 so far in the series. Um, a lot of them talk about the screens that we were talking about um, when it, as it relates to sleep and vision and, and what's good, what's not good. So there's a lot of good information on there. Um, as we talked about before, limiting screen time. Um, so you're not uh, exhausting your dopamine. And I think that can, this is definitely a hot button topic and, it, and, and that's why we have a whole nother talk about it because it, that whole talk is worth an hour. Um, the idea is, is screen time is, the way to think of screen time is uh, social media, video games, um, not what we're doing right now, not what your kid's doing, um, online learning, not that kind of stuff. It's and unfortunately, we may wish it was, we, they were more engaged. You know, the evidence is with some of that is that we're seeing that they're not, um, or not as engaged as they would be in, in person. Um, so it's just knowing what your kids are doing and how much they're on these devices doing those different activities so it can uh, lower the amount of dopamine being exhausted. Um, sorry, I, there's a question. I know you might not have um, this answer yet, but are we going to be able to course correct this for our children once we get to a normal routine? So um, I'll answer that question now. So the question was, uh, the, will, will we cor uh, correct, course correct? And I think we has to be defined. I think our kids, our kids are incredibly resilient to begin with. Um, and it goes back to that neuroplasticity. 
uh, of their brain. So let's say they developed an anxious brain. Let's let's take the the kid that had the the cloud anxiety. Um, through work and effort and energy, he was able to eradicate that anxiety. Um, that doesn't mean something else won't come along and and start messing with him in a different way. But yes, they they can fundamentally, given the tools and pointed in the right direction and with practice. And sometimes you got to think, you know, it takes 66 days on average for a habit to develop. Um, sometimes that can happen quicker if it's a bad habit. Um, so it takes that amount of time, if not longer, to build a new pathway. And a new neural pathway is just a new response to the same stimulus. So kids can absolutely do that. The adults may have a little harder time. Kind of goes back to that, that focus and energy to break some of those habits. Um, and, and so I think there's, there's a lot of variables that go into, can we course correct, but I go back to given the right tools and the right energy and focus, you, we absolutely can course correct, um, some of these things that may have developed. Um, so it's important kind of going back to the tools here, it's important to take breaks. Um, so your eyes are an extension of your brain. Their job is to, to take all this information in and, and sort it and put it into the parts of the brain that need it. And part of that is deciding what to pay attention to. And so like this uh, screen now, um, you're getting adrenaline because hopefully you're learning some things that you haven't learned before. So that's accessing parts of your brain that are not normally on unless you're doing something challenging. And so that's a good thing. It goes back to that you can't just exhaust that over the course of a day because you're gonna get worn out. It's kind of like a, the gazelle. If it doesn't get a chance to recharge, then it's not going to end well for the gazelle. Um, and so one thing you can do, and I, and I have my kids do this, is you can take a break. So in between breaks, whether you've decided to give yourself a break or it's a natural break for your kids or things like that, they need to change their field of vision. And so when we're doing the one thing like this or looking at our phone or playing a video game like that, high rates of adrenaline, lots of focus. There's a lot of energy being spent on that activity. So when you switch off and ideally it would be get up, go outside and just stare off into the void, kind of like you're not looking at anything while looking at everything, you allow your adrenaline to switch off when you do that. It's an adrenaline break. And so if you'll do that for, let's say you get two minutes, that's a, that's a huge benefit to your brain even for two minutes. If you can do it longer, great. Um, but I know, you know kids are in, in between classes and things like that. Um, so you have to physically get up. If you can't go outside, uh, at least go to the window and look out into nothing, even if it's the next door neighbor's house, just look at like the whole big void and it allows that brain to recalibrate and take that switch. Um, and that's really, really important because like I said, we are spending a lot of time on our devices. And so we're just trading off one adrenaline thing for another thing. Um, and in, and in, in terms of screens, it's even more intimate. So it means it's even more encompassing and more adrenaline provoking. Um, these next two things I'm going to demonstrate, um, but if you feel that emotional temperature going up and you feel, or your child or whoever is kind of feeling out of control and like it's rising quicker than you want to, um, and there's not a reason for it to rise. So you want to make sure that your internal state and your external state are kind of in rhythm with each other. Um, so if, if something's going on, that's causing your adrenaline to shoot up, there may be a reason you should be doing that. Um, and so if it's not, if the, it's shooting up and the environment is, is calm, but you feel it internally shooting up, this is a really cool thing to do. Um, so it's called the double breath. Essentially, you're going to take a huge breath in and then another breath as much as you can get. And then you're going to let it out through the mouth. So it goes like this. And you need to do that at least three times. What that does is it resets your CO2 and O2 levels because when that emotional temperature rises, we're getting out of whack. Um, your dog does this automatically. You do this automatically at night. You're not aware of it, obviously. Um, but your body does this in a natural cadence without you being aware. When you take control of your breath, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and you can have a lot of incredible benefits when you do that. So that's one way to get that, if that temperature is rising, to bring it back down. Ironically, you can also do something with your breath if you're feeling apathetic or unmotivated and you need to put yourself into action. 
you can do it with breath work too. So you, you essentially you take a deep breath in through the nose and you let out through your, through your mouth in rapid succession, you go. You wanna do it at least 20 times. What that does is it actually gets your adrenaline on board and now you're ready um, to get into action because you got the adrenaline on board. And then the other things to do, um, which is just really good maintenance, um, it's really good breath work and, and mindfulness meditation and hypnosis, uh, not hypnosis, like when you go up on stage and, and, and bark like a dog, but just deep thought. Um, it's kind of uh, vacillating between a uh, deep sleep state and, and somewhat of a wake state um, with hypnosis, but meditation, mindfulness, yoga, any of those things, any of those things you can teach your kids, all that stuff is incredible stuff. Um, that's really good for base work. Um, and it just helps that emotional temperature stay at a place it needs to stay at and maybe not as climb as quick as, uh, as it would if we didn't otherwise do those things. So that is the information. Um, I'm gonna, there's all our information. Um, if you have questions about the presentation, I'm happy to, I'll stick around and answer and I'll unmute us here in a second. Um, but if you are watching this or just don't have time, you gotta break off and go eat. Um, feel free to call me. That's my number and that's my email address. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. And um, this will be available uh, tomorrow uh, and I will send it to your counselors and then they'll send it out to, um, to y'all as parents. Let me stop sharing and then I'll unmute. If I can figure it out. Okay, so everyone can, I think I did it right. Everyone can unmute themselves if they want to, if anybody has any questions. Okay, no questions? We, uh, hey, this is Candace, just quick question. I know, um, um, well, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your uh, probably dinner time. Um, and if there's things you need us to follow up on, we'd be happy to, uh, to do that. Y'all have a, a great day and a great evening. Bye.